All right, so the beaver's been going crazy. He's, he's working like a beaver. The pond is almost built, and so we're gonna go see if we can reposition the camera to get a better view of the progress that he's making. So I've got this steel post, we're gonna stick it into the ground, and then we're gonna attach the uh, trail cam. We tried it already, but it wasn't positioned very well. So we're gonna give it a go and see if we can't get some footage of him working away. What's really cool about this dam is that there was an existing beaver deceiver there and the water level's high enough that it's actually flowing again. So we'll go down there, take a look at what he's doing and some of the effects that it's going to end up having on the property, um, beneficial effects. See what he did overnight. Okay, let's go down. Okay, so we've got a bridge right here and I think in the past these beavers have probably threatened the bridge and that's why there's a beaver deceiver there. And I also think probably the past owner had some conflict with the beaver because he really wanted his bridge and anyways, I think the dam got taken out. The beavers are back, we did a, we've done a video about this already and what's really interesting about it is I can already see improvements in water quality. So this is upstream of the beaver and it's pretty murky in here. I think it's pretty normal for this watershed. I don't know what's going on upstream and why, where the silt or debris is coming from. But beaver dams are known for slowing water down. When you slow water down, suspended solids come out of suspension and they act a little bit like a biofilter. Now, from our rainwater harvesting experience, I have a theory that all the different edges and sticks and branches and weeds that they put into the dam create tons of surface area for biofilms to form. So as the water percolates through the dam, I have this theory that the dam itself is acting as a biofilter because of all the surface area and the biofilms that are cleaning the water as it actively passes through it. And what's really neat, we're gonna go over to the dam now and set up the trail cam. You can see a marked improvement in the, the water leaving the dam. The other really cool thing now is that as the water level is rising, it hasn't been this high for quite a while, not consistently, I mean, we've had floods and stuff, but the flow here is less than the flow leaving the dam. And yesterday, my kids were trying to kayak down the creek below the dam, and uh, they had done it a couple of days previous to that and had no problem, but yesterday they came home and they said, there's not enough water in the creek anymore. And so the difference between when they were able to kayak and when they weren't able to kayak is essentially the flow rate difference that occurred as a result of this dam raising the level and encouraging lateral infiltration into the banks. Now that water doesn't disappear forever. It's charging groundwater aquifers. It's also charging just the wetland or the riparian zone around here. And so if we ever have a drought year in the future, and this was kind of what Glennis Hood was getting across in her book, The Beaver Manifesto, is that places that had active beaver activity didn't have droughts. The droughts disappeared. And you can kind of see why that would happen. And so for us, I'd rather just raise that bridge up and accommodate whatever level the beaver wants to have then get rid of the beaver because inevitably we will have dry years here and so the 20 or 50 or 60 acres I haven't counted it yet that I have on these flats these creek flats on this creek and the creek on the other side will represent one of the most opportune grazing areas both at the end of the summer when the rains stop but in the event of a drought period, I will have an endless amount of feed down here for whatever animals I choose to graze, either goats or cows or llamas or sheep or pigs, uh, because the, there's so much water stored. And when the inflow is lower because we have lower rainfall in drought years, these banks will give some of that water back to the creek and keep that perpetual creek motion flowing.
There's a quote in the design manual, permaculture design manual that Bill Mollison provides, and he said that rain in Paris flow, uh, drops less than 5% of the year. And we'll put the quote into the video. I can't, I'm just remembering it off uh, memory right now. But rain flows less than 5% of the year, yet the Seine, which is the river that goes through Paris, flows 365 days of the year. And so that's pretty amazing when you consider it. Like at 5% out of all the hours, so if there's 8,670 hours in a year, 5% of those hours is raining in Paris, yet that river flows all the time. And that flow is a, is a response to the water stored in the banks and in the groundwater that allows that river to continue to flow. So it behooves us to not encourage this type of activity because the fish only need to be without water for five minutes and they're dead. We need to encourage water harvesting in the same way that ecosystems have done it for billions of years in order to make sure that we have resources like this which we can put to productive use. And so one of the things I want to explore on this farm is how we do regenerative fer farming and permaculture in a way, and, and less about permaculture because this is, this is the MO of permaculture, but regenerative farming in a way that works with the ecosystems, finds those win-win situations that allows us to do things we couldn't normally do because conventionally in industrial ag, we look at these things as liabilities, as um, blockades to productivity. And that's primarily because industrial ag is focused on finding single yields. So bushels of grain, kilograms of pork, liters of milk. And if instead we look at our systems as having multiple yields and how to work with those yields as they change season to season, then I think we end up in a situation where we're partnering with nature, nature's getting better, we're getting better, um, we're producing nutrient-dense food, we're able to make a livelihood, um, air is cleaner, water is cleaner, I mean those are the win-win situations that we're looking for. And so we're going to continue to explore that on this farm and documenting it uh, on YouTube and whatever other mediums we choose to, to document it on. So let's go take a look at that dam over there and we're going to go set up that trail cam. We can look at the water quality here and as it's coming out of the, out of the dam there and just have a look. All right, so this pipe here goes through the dam wall and then it's hard to see because it's submerged now, but there's a big basket around the intake. And that basket basically is an attempt at trying to stop the beavers from plugging this off. And that's called the beaver deceiver. And so the idea is that if you set the pipe at the right elevation, then the pond will remain at that elevation. However, I have a concern about this beaver deceiver and I'm gonna do something about it. If we set the pond level too low and there is in fact baby beavers in here or two-year-old beavers I guess which is probably the case then when the ice freezes in the winter time they're not gonna have enough room under the ice to store all their food and be able to get access to it so because I didn't set this what I want to do is put a monk on it so I'm going to put an elbow, not today, but in the future, I'm going to put an elbow and a, a vertical riser, and that way I'll be able to set the pond level higher. And if I want, if I set it up properly, I'll be able to twist the monk in either direction and influence the pond height. I want to give these beavers the best chance of survival, and the nice thing with a monk is that if for whatever reason I do need to reduce the level down the road, I'll have the ability to do that. This is also a really nice feature here because I could theoretically hook a pump up to it if I wanted to and pump water up the hill. If I ever had to fight a fire, look at the reservoir I've got now. Like a big pump right here with no shortage of water that I have access to if I had to fight a fire somewhere. So, I could even put a small little overshoot water wheel here if I if I had to.
or some sort of micro hydro. This is just an incredible, really, really cool resource. So we're gonna set up our trail cam close to where this camera is right now, point it at the dam and see if we can get some activity when we're not here. So the trail cam is set up now. And uh, I think the water is not as clean as I thought it looked yesterday. I don't know, it's hard for me to tell for sure if there's a market improvement, we'd have to get a, a Sachi disc, which is a, something they use in, in aquaculture to measure turbidity. At this point, I'd just be guessing. Yesterday, it definitely looked cleaner, but uh, I might have just been imagining things. But you kind of get a sense of what I was talking about. All these little surface areas, and even they've got soil and mud in there, so there's going microbes. All that water is filtering through this pond it's absolutely going to have a cleaning effect on the water. What, I can't visually see it right now. We'd have to get some other instruments to test it out. You've got to get a sense now. So before this pond existed, the water level would have been down here. They've literally raised it close to two feet. And I bet you they're going to try and get to three feet. That's three feet higher than it was before, which means it's three feet of water that could potentially go laterally into these wetland areas right here. So as you can sense, I'm pretty excited about this. I love water harvesting. I especially love it when somebody else is doing the work for me. And these guys are basically going to be on the job 24-7. I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to pay them a salary. They're just working for the property and we benefit from their ingenuity. So stay tuned, in the future we'll share some of the trail cam footage that we get and keep reporting back on this beaver dam as it changes and, and they continue to evolve the structure itself. Okay, see you in the next video. Thank you.